Welcome to this week's edition of the Bailo Report. I'm Jade Bailo. Our guest this week is former Senate Majority Leader and now candidate for the Republican nomination for running for governor, Paul Gazelka. And we welcome you back. It's good to be back. Uh, through COVID, I didn't come here, so it's really, really good to be here. It is. It is. All right. Why are you running for governor? Well, I think we're way off track. Uh, the governor, Tim Walls, ran on one Minnesota. I've never seen Minnesota more divided, more angry, more afraid. Uh, issues related to our businesses not thriving, our kids not getting the education they want. But the biggest issue is people don't feel safe like they did before. And that's the public safety, in my opinion, will be the biggest issue and the biggest difference between myself and the governor. Okay, and what would you do differently? First of all, I wouldn't talk about defunding the police. I wouldn't talk about the police doing a bad job. I think most police do a really good job. In Minneapolis, police went from about 800 to down to about 500. They're frustrated because of the lack of respect that they get uh, there. And as a result, crime has gone way, way up. When the riots happened, I would have been much, much more proactive at getting the guard out early rather than waiting about four or five days and, and having 1,500 businesses damaged or destroyed, mostly minority, and then, then acting. By then it was too late. And so that's going to be the big issue. And the police know that I've been standing up for the work that they're doing. And as a result, they've been endorsing me or giving me, me their awards, thanking me for thanking them for the work they do. Good. You uh, had a successful session in the Senate. Tell us uh, the biggest accomplishment. Yeah, so it's divided government. Minnesota's the only state where the, the House and Senate are run by two different parties. First of all, the fact that we balanced a two-year budget when we're divided like that, I think speaks a lot to Minnesota and my leadership and working with the, the Speaker of the House. I wanted to make sure that we didn't raise any taxes and we didn't do that. That was something I thought we had plenty of money to spend on education and health care, the environment, etc. So that was a big thing that we accomplished. Uh, in addition to that, we did look at reforms for public safety and passed them. Basically two years in a row we've passed a lot of reforms. But I made sure they weren't anti-police and I made sure that they didn't take away the tools that the police needed. And so just the fact that we funded a two-year budget without raising taxes, taking care of the needs of Minnesota was really positive with divided government. Okay, uh, but your biggest accomplishment then was the budget? Sure, uh, it's because every two years you have to pass, pass a balanced budget in Minnesota. And then within the budget, I mean, we, we put more money into broadband, which is a big issue, especially with more people doing Zoom uh, and more people moving out of Minneapolis and St. Paul. We really needed to work on more resources there. And then we had a lot of money that came from the federal government to try to deal with all of the different shutdowns and the problems that that created. And so we had to disperse that. I wanted to make sure that we spent the money without adding new programs that would create new taxes down the road. And so really it was just trying to manage the resources we had in a way that didn't put us in jeopardy down the road. And you would describe yourself as a moderate? A no, moder I'm, a, I'm a conservative, but I'm also pragmatic, which means I will build coalitions in whatever way necessary to get the job done. That's why I said the fact that uh, the speaker, who I think is pretty liberal and I'm pretty conservative, the fact that we could find the middle, uh, which we're, is, we're, we have to do, the fact that I could do that I think is really important. And this is your second time on the program. You were here for the Rochester Area Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I think it was Economic Development yeah. Forum. And uh, at that time, you were not thinking about governorship. I was not. And what can you do then as governor that you could not accomplish as the majority leader? So our government needs to be a lot more efficient. We continue to grow and grow and grow. Back in 2011, the budget was about 34 billion. 
not very, you know, this is just 11 years later and we're at 52 billion. So I really do want to watch the growth of government. One of the things I would do right away is simply a hiring freeze to make sure that we start using technology and, and, and figure out how we can make our government more efficient. You can't just keep going to raise taxes, which is what uh, both Democrat uh, Governor Walls and Democrat Governor Dayton always propose more taxes. Well, we're the fifth highest tax state in the country and more and more businesses and wealthy people are moving out. We need them to stay. We, they're, the, they're typically the most generous. They provide the jobs that we need. And so I think we need to be more business friendly. Uh, I will say many of the things I stopped this year were, were more business mandates, particularly on the small business, and those are the ones that are struggling the most. The businesses are saying the biggest thing that they need is workers, mm -hmm. trained workers. Mm -hmm. What can we do about that? So they talk about three things in Minnesota. One is over taxation, which causes them to look other places, over regulation, which causes them to look other places, and then hiring a well-educated workforce. And that third one is the one that we, it's a struggle across the country because as, peop, as our population is aging, there's less younger people in the workforce. So we have to think a little bit more creatively. Uh, I'm, I'm supportive of legal immigration. That's how we get more people into the workforce. But we also have a lot of people that aren't in the workforce that should be in the workforce. Anybody that is on welfare that could be working, we need to get back to work. So we have to figure out that relationship between uh, welfare benefits and actually getting people back into the workforce. Uh, with the COVID, there were federal benefits to increase unemployment benefits, and that caused people not to be in the workforce. So some states did not take that. They said, no, it's more important that people get into the workforce, and so they've been more successful at actually moving their economies because they have more workers. I tried to order a Domino's pizza the other day, and they said, It'll, we'll get, get it to you in two hours. I said, two hours? They said, we don't have enough workers. And so that's the problem all the way through. So legal immigration is part of the way we can do it, and also helping more people that could be working to get into the workforce. What about the former uh, vocational schools? Mm -hmm. And they have been replaced by the community and technical colleges because they provided a workforce for Minnesota in the 40s and 50s mm -hmm. that we haven't seen since. Are you uh, suggesting some reforms there? Absolutely. And I'm working with the 49ers, pipe fitters, electrical contractors, carpenters union. They need more workers. Uh, they are willing to train them. They will send them to their own training centers. Uh, but to give students more opportunities in high school to see jobs that often can pay six figures. Some of these blue collar jobs today are very competitive to what you would get in a job going to a four year college. And so what's the best fit for the, the person that wants to get a job and what kind of job? And so that is clearly a path that could help a lot of people. Some students have huge amounts of debts that they're never gonna be able to pay off and some of those students should have gone the blue collar route. Okay, so what about that student debt? Their uh, efforts at the federal level to try and take care of some of that debt, is it not enough? So I'm not in favor of just waiving everybody's student debt now. There's a lot of people that had to work full time, 40 hours a week, so that they could pay off their student loans. And so to suddenly give it free to everyone else would not be fair. We do need to figure out how to control the costs of college. It, it is way, way more expensive than it used to be. If you just increase inflation, it's significantly higher. And, and so we have to figure out how do we make sure uh, kids get the best education they can at a rate that they can afford. I had to work 40 hours a week while I went to college. So I know the value of that, that degree, but I also had to work for it. Okay. You have a big task ahead of you. How about school choice for the elementary and secondary grades? 
I think school choice is really important. Uh, the parents driving the direction for the education of their kids, particularly kids in Minneapolis and St. Paul that are in failing schools, they should have more opportunities. The, the workforce of the future is going to not is going to be many more minority students that are going to be the workforce, and yet they're failing in the schools in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Compared to other urban areas, Minneapolis and St. Paul is doing poorly. So more and more, some of the minority communities are saying, we want more choice. And so now they actually stand with us during our press conferences because we've been saying that students should have more choice. The parents, if their kids are in a failing school, they need more opportunities to succeed. So I'm a big fan of, letting, of, of more choice for students, letting the parents help guide their kids to the most successful path they can be on. So would you say the funding should follow the student then? Or at least in some combination. Like three years ago we passed opportunity scholarships which allowed uh, wealthy people to donate into funds that would help kids that couldn't afford to go somewhere else. This year we did education savings accounts, a similar model. But frankly I would go a long way towards giving kids more kids and their parents more choice about what direction to go. I do think at some level the dollars should follow the student. I think that's, you know, in, in the end, uh, I think it makes every education system better when they have to compete for that, that student because now they want to make sure they're offering that student the best possible education. And one other area related to that, people are leaving the public school now in bigger numbers and part of it is because of what they're teaching related to America. And many parents are frustrated. It's one of the terms is critical race theory, but it's, it's when you teach history in such a way that when a kid graduates, they're not proud to be citizens of the greatest country in the world. We should talk about the flaws. There's, we should never uh, avoid that. But there's so many triumphs that America has been part of that kids need to know so that when they graduate, they feel good about who they are and the country they're from. And uh, with the teachers union feeling so strongly about critical race theory, mm -hmm. how do you reconcile that? I'm going to be opposed to them. I, you think about, for example, they want to change our history standards so they don't have to talk about George Washington, World War I, World War II, the Holocaust. Well, let's just take World War II. Uh, America sent to die 10,000 soldiers at D-Day that took, we took the two toughest beaches to land back on the main continent of Europe to push Hitler back. We took the toughest beaches, America did. And if we're never going to talk about things like that that America has done for the world, then people are wrong, left with the wrong perception of America. So critical race theory is basically, in my mind, anti-American propaganda, where you're not, you're only focused on our flaws, slavery. We ended slavery. Slavery was over the entire world at that time. We fought a civil war to end slavery. I'm not proud that there were colonies that had slavery, but we ended slavery. And so that's where telling the whole story, I think, is really important. Good luck with that. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, really, it's a big challenge, but I, I think if we don't, when people start talking about the flag as a, a racist symbol, I just totally disagree. They've missed the whole concept of America. How about mentorships with uh, industry? I'm surprised the legislature has not addressed that in a big way. There is some attempt to tie higher education with business, with the jobs that are available for the future. I think more of that is important down the path. And then same thing with the trades, tying trades to high school to the opportunities are, that are there. I think more, the more that we partner together, the better. One of the colleges that I rep represented, Central Lakes College in Brainerd, I now, I now am just outside of that district. But they did a lot of that. So they were pointing kids to the jobs of the future. So, but they were working with the industry and the classes that they had there. For example, they have one of the largest robotics um, um, curriculums in the country, and they have huge uh, placement if somebody goes through there to jobs that are available. I think that's education of the future, lining up careers with the jobs that are available. All right. Our welfare system is costly and generous. 
and what would you do with respect to that? I don't want our welfare benefits any better than the states around us. I don't want to be a magnet uh, for people that want to come here for the welfare benefits. I want people to come here to work and be a part of our great state. Uh, at the same time, making sure that we help people that are in, in a desperate need. That's, that's what welfare so, is supposed to be for. And so uh, I don't think it ever changed, So, but I'm going to say I looked at this a number of years ago and then decided not to go any farther. But if our welfare card, the EBT card, if it can be used in all 50 states, is used in all 50 states like Hawaii, then maybe we need to think about how we do that. Uh, if if people are moving here for welfare, maybe we need to have a longer period before you can move into Minnesota to get our welfare. And so it's, it, welfare is really critical when people are in a, uh, a spot where they need some help, and I want to help them. But I also know that if they have no incentive to go to work, I really haven't helped them. Yeah, there is truth to that. Um, the transportation system in Minnesota mm -hmm and the uh, debate about electric vehicles versus the carbon yeah. dependent ones, where are you there? So this was a huge debate at the Capitol and I believe electric cars are the future. I just don't want to push them faster than our market can handle. The governor is mandating electric cars and, and basically an auto dealer will have to carry about 7% of his stock in electric cars when right now the demand is 1%. So who's going to pay for that extra expense? And, and what it's going to do is drive up the cost of used gas-driven cars, which is going to hurt the lower income the most. And so I see it coming, and we should encourage cleaner energy, but it also needs to be affordable and reliable. If we, move, if we move too fast, then it's not affordable and it's not reliable. And so we all, we all agree that we should be pushing that direction, but we shouldn't be making mandates that make it difficult for people in this transition. So it's coming. I support it. I just don't support the way the governor did it. How do you uh, view what the president has done in terms of the pipeline? and uh, changing our energy independence? What do you think? The president made a huge mistake. Uh, energy independence is a national security issue. Mining up in northern Minnesota, the precious metals, is a national security issue. So he drove gas from $2 a gallon to $3 a gallon. We're still using gas. And so why, why shouldn't we have used that pipeline through America with all the jobs it would provide and the national security issue that it, it ensured that we were independent. Minnesota had its own struggle with Line 3. Line 3 pipeline, it was a 60-year-old pipe and somehow they didn't think that we should replace that one with a brand new pipe, which was much safer and better than uh, transporting oil through, through trains. I mean, there was, for the environmentalists, they should have said, this is the most important thing we could do right now but we literally had to fight the governor to get this done. And you know, if you're an environmentalist, it was a good idea. If you drive a gas-driven vehicle, you have no excuse. You are driving a gas, you know, otherwise don't drive a gas-driven vehicle if that's how sure you are. But we are moving to cleaner energies and I, everybody wants that. So I'm not, I'm not saying, clean energy is important. I think that's a good goal. It's just, like I said, reliable and affordable. Whether that's the heat in your house or the, how you drive a vehicle, there's a pace that we need to follow. If you go too fast, people can't afford it and it creates hardship. So where are we with that pipeline now? It's, it's all finally through. It took more than six years to get it done. Um, you know, the, the governor, one of the first things he did when he became governor is his energy commissioner sued the PUC when he had promised some of the blue collar unions that he would make sure it got done right away. And so that has created some hardship where they don't, they don't trust him because he didn't really fulfill what he said. But finally it went through all the courts and it's going to happen. And I, one thing I'll say about that too, I appreciate that the police were up there, the highway patrol, they were sleeping in cots in the Civic Center in Thief River Falls willingly 
to make sure they were close to the pipeline to protect the workers who were being uh, followed by some of these protesters, many of them from out of state, but they were also protecting the protesters that sometimes they would chain them to a piece of equipment that was very dangerous for that person's life. And so I really appreciate that they, they slept on cots to make sure they were there to help keep people safe. All right. But do you think the future is electric? Yeah, yeah it's, it's coming. GM has already said we want to have all electric vehicles. So then you have to work on building the infrastructure. My wife and I have relatives in Tulsa. That's a long drive from central Minnesota. Uh, you know, we really try to get there in one day. The way technology is right now, it would take four days. So I'd, I'd get there and I'd have to turn around. So some of those issues we have to figure out, uh, but I do believe technology will keep developing so that'll be part of the the future of being able to charge it much quicker. Would you describe yourself as a climatologist? Cosmetologist? Climatologist. <laughs> oh, climat no, oh, I'm sorry. It's my hearing aids. Uh, no, I, I think that we need to take care of the environment no matter what. Whether you believe God created it or you believe in global warming or climate change, I think we all have the same goal of, of taking care of this earth. You know, it's a gift that we have and so Taking, you know, when we when we mine, for example, that we do it in a being good stewards, making sure that we follow all the regulations so that we don't ruin the preciousness of the environment up north, which is where I'm from. Uh, when we do agriculture, the the farmer, I think, has the most invested to make sure they're taking care of the land because they want to pass it on to the next generation. But it, it's thinking about that and then balancing that with the needs of agriculture or the needs, needs of industry. And that's where I, I don't always draw the same line that some do that are, are environmentalists. They don't think about the industries that have to prosper for us to have warm homes and air conditioning and being able to drive and turn on lights. Those are all gifts that we have that I would never sacrifice to go so far to the left. I think that's a mistake. All right. The uh, next issue that we have not talked about. What, what have we not talked about? That's an important one. You want to talk about mass oh. mandates or vaccine yes, mandates? Yes, well, yes, yes. See, what, I read your mind. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about your attitude about mandates. Yeah. So I, the Senate, we never mandated the masks. The governor had control over the rest of the state. In the Senate, I strongly suggested people wear a mask, and most people wore a mask. Um, I think when you mandate things, you take away people's liberty. I think you lead them by encouragement. So I, I had COVID, and, and my wife had COVID. We still got vaccinated. We think that was a good idea. We think people should get vaccinated, but I think forcing people to get vaccinated is a mistake, because what's the next thing that government will say you must do? I think we have to, to educate people and then give them their choice. And so I would have never closed schools. Parochial schools stayed open and they didn't lose that year of education. Uh, to date, only two people have died, school age kids, between the beginning of COVID and now. Many more people died from suicide and some of those because of the, the, the lack of social interaction. I mean, it was a, it was a huge risk to close the schools down. And now we've seen the test scores and they were, some kids literally lost a full year of education for their future. We shouldn't have done that. Like I said, parochial schools were open. Others, other uh, states had schools open. Other countries had schools open. We chose to close the schools. I think that was a mistake. Okay. The uh, federal government gave us money for heroes. Mm -hmm. Where did that go? Has it, have they uh, decided yet? Yeah, the federal government uh, put between Trump's stimulus and Biden's two stimulus plans, about $18 billion of extra money came into our system. But the most recent amount that went directly to the state was $3 billion, of which we could use on many programs. One of the programs that we elected was uh, uh, those, those that were on the front lines, frontline worker bonuses. And we set aside 250 million. Both sides are working through uh, agreeing what should be on that. And then the governor 
and the current four leaders will decide when we have a special session. There's some other twists in that, in that uh, people are frustrated with some of the mandating of vaccines. So some people have talked about language uh, protecting people's privacy issues, so that's an issue. And then some people have expressed some frustrations about some commissioners not doing well. So it's a unique um, situation where we're at where the governor calls the special session and normally the governor only does it if the four leaders agree on what's in the special session. So that's sort of what's happening right now. And where are we right now? Well, we, uh, I'm no longer the leader, so I do know uh, that the four leaders are having conversation with the governor about what, what should be in that special session. And, and then once they agree, they sign a document and that's what, that's what ends up being in the special session. So exactly what's going to happen, I don't know, other than uh, Jeremy Miller is now our new majority leader. He has said we need to get the $250 million to the workers for their bonus. Tell me, uh, when are you looking at first responders as heroes? Yeah, there, there's a large list. The, the first and foremost list that the most money would go to were, were the people directly uh, connected to people that were, were dealing with COVID. So for sure, the nursing homes, for example, that was where the most deaths were, the most people infected with COVID. They were on everybody's list. Uh, and so th there was two pots of money. One of the pots of money would have a little more money per worker, around $1,000. And then there was a, another pot of money for the many different groups that we're all asking to have that bonus, that would be a smaller amount of money. Are you using some of Minnesota's money to augment this? No, no, there's, right now we've set aside $250 million for that bonus, but we left an additional billion dollars, one billion uh, from the federal stimulus that we could use on, on whatever we want. It could be for worker bonuses, there's a lot of issues that are going to be coming up that we don't know about and, and, and do know about. For example, all of the employers, the small businesses, all of their workers that were closed down or shut down, they got unemployment. And for a long period of time, that came from a fund that these small business owners actually have to fund. And so they're talking about a 14 percent increase in that fund. Well, we could put money into that because the government is the ones that shut down these, these, these companies. And so that, that's another issue that has come up that we have to oh. think about. So All many right. of those. We're down to our last couple of minutes. And my question is, what is your main goal? What would be your main goal as Minnesota's governor? I'm going to look over here. So my goal, frankly, is to get Minnesota back on track. I really do believe that if Republicans win House, Senate, Governor, there will be more prosperity that comes to Minnesota, and not just for a select few, but our goal is for everyone. So reforming education, making, making sure our streets are safe, making sure that businesses thrive and, and have a, a well-educated workforce so that we can prosper across the board. When, every, when we do well, everyone succeeds, and so that, that will be my goal as I focus on Minnesota. As I said, people don't feel safe, uh, they don't feel like their kids are getting the best education they have, and they don't feel like the opportunities are there across the board in the workplace, and so that'll be my focus. All right. How's that? And that's fine. And uh, Paul, thank you for the time, the information and your willingness to uh, run for something that is so time consuming. Yes. But we'll uh, look forward to talking with you again. Thank you, Jane, you had great questions. And we'll look forward to Matt Soley's article on the Rochester Post Bulletin. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for your interest in state and local government. We'll be with you next week, same time, same channel. In the meantime, have a very good week and have a very good night.